Welcome to another episode of Infralytics. Today we are going to talk about tactical security intelligence and zero trust architecture. How to adapt your SIM and security operations center with Justin Henderson. Justin Henderson is a certified science instructor and he's also a member of the cybersecurity Blue Guardian team at SANS. He's authored a number of courses at SANS and he's also the founder of H&A Security Solutions and the lead consultant there. Hi Justin, welcome to the show. Today, let's, let's jump right straight into the topic. Let's start with tactical intelligence for security operations. So can you define, can you talk a little bit about what is tactical intelligence? Why do you need one? What are, what's the difference? So, talk a little yeah, no. so <clears throat> first off, I mean, we're talking words here, right? Like you've got all different types of intelligence, threat intelligence, things like that. Kind of the key word to pivot off here is tactical. What we have a problem of a lot of is organizations spend massive amounts of money on CapEx, products, solutions, on people, OpEx side, and detection is horrendous. <laughs> like every day you hear about these new attacks and quite frankly, some of them are blatantly obvious and should have been caught way earlier in the spectrum but instead we hear about it once it's mass catastrophe it's in our face you've been hacked you've been pwned so tactical security intelligence is this concept of well i'm not going to be perfect but i don't want to be poor how do i figure out what adversaries are doing their methodologies how are they going to attack my environment and then how do I tailor visibility around that? It's focus on detection. So this would be, you know, attacker comes in, they send you a phishing email. Well, that had to go through your email systems, your spam filters, it hit a desktop or laptop. From there, someone opens a phishing leak because they click it or they open attachment and it runs a macro. Right. Well, there's a lot of visibility on the desktop, on the laptop. There's a little bit of visibility in the email systems themselves. Mm -hmm. And then when that executes and it launches out to the attacker system, there's even more visibility. Now, if we think of the traditional kind of old school managed security service provider, MSSP, they would have things like, okay, you need an intrusion detection system. You need a SIM. Yep. And you need to do logging on all of your critical servers. Uh -huh. But the problem is that at the point that your critical servers are being attacked, that is called a login. <laughs> <laughs> so we, it's tactical in that you have to find the right visibility at the right data sources, because uh -huh. you do want to do critical server monitoring, but now you're looking for log on behaviors, user activity, uh -huh. user behavior that's non-standard, which requires you to know what normal is. Uh -huh. So it's easier to focus on things like exploits running on desktops and laptops and those type of things. So it's the tactical visibility in detection data sources and what to analyze. So in this case, you're looking at data sources primarily from a end user perspective, or are you looking at it from the, the desktops or are you also bringing in the servers and kind of things yeah. like that? What are the points that you're looking at? Yeah, so the key here would just be, if you know kind of what the attacker is going to do and you stop and think about it, then what should we be doing? Because <clears throat> what most organizations are doing is doing critical alerting and monitoring back where the data normally resides, but the best visibility to see the attacker doesn't exist there, it exists earlier on like the desktops and laptops. Okay. Like. Um, you know, we have antivirus, we have firewalls, we have all these technologies and they're great and all, but if it doesn't let you see a modern attack, which doesn't mean advanced, because I think that's where the misunderstanding is. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely APT, advanced persistent threats, but there's also a bunch of really easy, modern PowerShell script-based, macro-based, that if you figure out here's what the attackers are doing mm -hmm. and you start to look for those where they occur, again, desktops, laptops, workstations, those might be easier to catch than the point that credentials were stolen. And now we're just looking for unusual activity. Because how do you define unusual? Well, you have to know what usual is. That's really hard. <laughs> so it's changing how you focus on that. So how do you how do you kind of look at patterns? I mean, you're talking about thousands of users, or I mean, it depends upon the size of the organization. Hundreds, anywhere from 
tens to hundreds and thousands of users how do you kind of understand the patterns of behavior of each and every user and see what is normal what is abnormal kind of yep, so <clears throat> method to the magnus kind of <laughs> yeah so f- first off i guess i would i would probably step back and first instead of trying to figure out cuz kind of what you're defining is anomaly detection mm-hmm. it's know a baseline d- find deviations and then investigate right and i want to do that but that's usually not where i would recommend organizations start cuz that is it's hard it requires maturity levels most organizations are here uh-huh. i want them to get to this point before they go to here and so at this point what i want organizations to do is find the most common attack vectors adversaries will use against us. There's kind of this mindset in the security field that everybody's a unique snowflake. Mm-hmm. So like maybe an organization's in retail, another organization's in healthcare. Therefore, they'll be attacked completely different and we can't standardize how we look for it. And that's not exactly true. Mm-hmm. Attackers use many of the same attack formats across all industries. Phishing is a great example. I fish you, it runs a macro, maybe it runs a macroless D, uh, DDA attack. Mm-hmm. If things like that occur, everybody can look for them. And so there's frameworks like the MITRE attack framework mm-hmm. that go through and they show you here's all the different things the adversaries will do and here's how you look for them in your organization. So we first start by looking for not a it's not quite a like an antivirus signature. Uh-huh. but it is a signature of attacker methodology when we identify that okay and if organizations start there their detection capabilities jump significantly then the next gap to your question is well then how do i go from here to know myself and uh this is going to be a really bad answer but i'm going to give it anyway <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is to know yourself you have to look and i realize that sounds really bad but many organizations i do consulting uh, i've done it in military municipalities retail healthcare finance like i've been in all sorts of industries higher ed yeah in the biggest problem i come in with as a consultant is they might have millions of dollars of tools and labor and i see their data and i look at it and i'm just like is this supposed to be occurring and they're like i don't know what's that it's like have you you looked at the data like like sim is not a central location to ignore things more efficiently <laughs> so, the the part is you got to look at it like uh, you know you hear things like you should segment your networks cuz that makes better defense and there's truth but when you segment and say here's my workstations here's my servers now what you've done is you've started to do that anomaly detection cuz you said well here's desktops your servers mm-hmm. and then from there you might break them out into more pieces here's IT workstations here's HR workstations here's accounting and if i define those now i can put simple rules in a intrusion detection system an IDS a sim mm-hmm. monitoring solution where i can say if anything that's a workstation yep talks to another workstation unless it came from IT alert yeah that's a good because one. shouldn't have happened Sure. Yeah. So it, it's really starting to identify your data, put it in different groupings, uh-huh. and then monitor for things that shouldn't be happening within those groupings. So, and really when people start to talk about things like data science, uh-huh. that is trying to automatically put things in groupings for you and then baseline and deviate. The problem is when it's done automatically, there's just a lot more false positives because it needs to take our logic and brain and right. apply it to the tool. There's a lot of success with those tools, but you still got to map our logic to them to filter that stuff out. Kind of. No makes sense. So, so I think yeah, the data science if you if it just looks at the past patterns and then kind of tries to come up with some stuff, then it's it's going to continue to do the same thing, right? So yes. you need to kind of think outside the human element is yep. not so think about like um you and I are humans. Like every morning maybe we get up we get up plus or minus 10 minutes uh maybe we hit the snooze on the alarm clock we come up we have breakfast we have a coffee and then we do that 30 days in a row and then day 31 i decide nah you know what i just not feel on the coffee this morning that doesn't mean i'm going to die of a heart attack that just means i deviated from normal right 
Now, you and I know, well, that's not that big of a deal, but does a computer know that? So this is where, again, I say start here, then work up to here, and then I would actually put some of the data science steps a little notch above this too. Mm -hmm. The base. So you talked about the metric framework, framework, and then starting from there, looking at it, and then also going into kind of the patterns, right? How to segregate the networks and so on. So, you know, if you were to look at your, you know, do you have to change your, the way your security operations center is organized, or do you also do any changes to your SIM current, how, what kind of changes, how do you adapt your SIM to these kind of a practical approach? Yeah, yeah. so to, to me, it's, it's definitely, you first got to figure out your staff, like your SOC is made up of different people. How do you get them to apply things like the MITRE attack framework? Well, they apply them with first getting their logic and then they put their logic in a tool. In this case, the tool just happens to be the SIM. Mm -hmm. So it would be things like, well, if we know adversaries do steps one, two, and three, because MITRE attack shows that, you know, it's not just theoretical, here are the different attack attackers that have truly done this. So therefore look for this. Okay, well, first off, do I have the right data sources? Oh, we're not collecting desktop logs. If I don't have desktop logs, I can't do that detection technique. So step one, collect the right data, which I now know what to collect because the framework's starting to tell me. Once I have that, I put in an alert rule to trigger off of that. And then step three is my SOC has to start investigating those and figuring out was this a true attack or a false positive. How to, and then tune the rules. So I'm going to start to organize and structure my SOC team. You know, who's responsible for interpreting these frameworks and identifying data sources. Maybe I have a dedicated engineer to get the data sources into a sim. Right. From there, that same engineer triggers the alerts. But now I have my analyst team, which is using the framework in a different way. It's how to interpret the results and chase them down. And now I need to have dashboards, visualizations, playbooks that help me sift through all of the massive data to find out if it's real. So you will adjust your teams based on these, and it's a it's you know it's a moving target. That's, that's security in general. It keeps changing. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's no yeah exactly. There's no specific pattern. It's not like a one done once and then go forget. Right? It's a constant thing. You just have to keep on improving the playbook and so. On. Yep. So, you know, is this something that is useful for all types of organizations or do you kind of recommend for specific types of organizations? What is, what's, I mean, if it's a, if it's a small, medium enterprise versus a large enterprise, how do you, how do you approach this? Yeah, usually if, if you're medium to large and, and by this, I would say organizations that are at least 5,000 employees up, mm -hmm. um, I usually try to recommend they go down the route of identifying someone, at least one, maybe two full-time staff that can build an internal SOC, buy some type of SIM, maybe roll your own open source if you want to, but that takes more OpEx versus CapEx on the commercial side, and get them to start to apply some of these rule sets. The reason I say medium to large is you should be able to afford staff to apply these techniques, these known techniques, and then those full-time hires can start to do the anomaly detection of know thyself because they have the time to do it. Right. So, and I'm talking one, maybe two full-time people at the entry level. For those who are small organizations, the answer really is it's, you don't have the finances to have a dedicated staff member for this. So for those, this is where the industry is getting better about things like SaaS offerings, software as a service. Like uh, there's Microsoft Sentinel, there's Splunk Cloud, there's the Elastic Cloud. Like, you know, I've entered this market, I have my own cloud offering that's SIM as a service. Mm -hmm. Basically have to find a way to at cost scale, get some of these detection places in, in place. The question changes here then, not to who to select, but what questions to ask of these providers yep. to make sure they're actually doing it seriously. Because the problem is when you start to do this at scale across multiple clients, you're fighting economies of scale. How can I make the most money <laughs> yeah, exactly. while being good at detection, but you don't actually want to be the greatest because then that brings the money down. So there's this fine balance of let's make a lot of money uh -huh. versus actually helping the clients out. So you're, you're looking for a partner. 
right. so. that, that, that makes sense. So now let's say you also want to talk about the zero trust architecture, right? Okay. So can you tell me a little bit about the zero trust architecture? So how does it fit into the, your overall yeah. security? Yeah, so zero trust is this new, uh, it, it's technically not new, but it's become idealized. It's this concept of trust nothing. <laughs> so we, we've always operated under the principle of least privilege, like only give people access to what they need, minimal, minimal, minimal. Right. But the problem is the concept with that is you give people access, you're giving them trust over time, they gain more and more trust mm -hmm. and it doesn't work out because over time, the, the longer someone exists, the more likely they're breached. Therefore, the higher the risk that asset is. Right. You know, a computer that I just deployed today is probably not infected. If I ask that same question three years from now, well, I don't know, it could be. Yeah. So zero trust is this concept of trust nothing, verify and validate everything. Right. So a computer one wants to talk to computer B. How would we verify that that's a trusted connection? Well, computer A authenticates to computer B, and maybe computer B also authenticates back to computer A. Then they encrypt everything and transmit because someone could be attacking in the middle and see what's going on from a packet level. Mm -hmm. So therefore we're doing authentication and encryption because we're validating everything through and through. That means you have to log and inspect everything. You have to authenticate everything. You have to encrypt everything. These are kind of the zero trust mandates. I like zero trust from a concept. Mm -hmm. I personally don't believe it is practical 100%. And what I mean by that is we all have tools, software, legacy applications that can't support everything that zero trust is talking about. Okay. And it's kind of like a chicken and an egg problem too, because how would you get access to a network? Because we can't always truly validate who we are, even if we have solutions like network access control. Uh -huh. So you're never fully going to implement zero trust. So instead, what you're trying to do is figure out what's the biggest bang for the buck mm -hmm. to get risk lowered and validate as much as I can from a quick whip. You know, uh, a computer starts to upload hundreds of gigs of data to the internet. We see that from flow data or through a firewall or a proxy. Uh -huh. Well, if I can see that, well, is that normal? Well, how would I validate that? It's to an external site that's not ours, or maybe it's something like Dropbox. Yeah. Well, with zero trust, since you're saying I'm going to log and inspect and validate all things, even if it's not mine, mm -hmm. I could say, well, I noticed via logs, I'm seeing this high outbound data. I'm concerned someone's stealing our patient information. Yeah. So what it can do is dynamically use that data to change our infrastructure. So for example, the firewall might not kill the connection, uh -huh. but it could do a quality of service and drop it so it only can upload at one megasecond. Mix. Yeah. So now it's super slow, which gives me time to investigate it. I walk over to the machine that's doing it. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're uploading a virtual machine to Microsoft for a support ticket. Yeah. That's a authorized action. I remove the quality service rule. You're back to whatever bandwidth you had before. I never killed the connection. So all I did was minorly annoy the user. All right. So zero trust to me is finding a practical line in the sand of how do I do as much validation? How can I add authentication encryption where it's warranted and feasible uh -huh. and going from there? So is the is the concept of zero trust? I mean, um, I mean, when you go for scale, right? When you go towards a large scale, mm -hmm. is it going to be practical? Is it in terms of you talked about the legacy applications where it's going to be difficult to implement and so on, right? Yep. But it's going to be practical when you talk about thousands of users, you know, and you are uh, looking at looking for okay, something abnormal? Are they doing something? Can we quickly? delay the process or do something to right. mitigate the risk is that is that a practical thing i think for things moving forward like projects that you're implementing moving forward they're great candidates to apply zero trust from the ground up 
-hmm. going back in time across everything especially legacy systems it's it's still a good idea but it, it does take a lot of time so it might be like organizations might have a single sign-on interface that controls access to all sorts of critical applications well that means they have one point of visibility and dynamic logic mm -hmm. you know, rather than saying you're allowed you're not allowed zero trust lets us put this wide range of gray area where i say and eh, that's kind of weird maybe we should do xyz oh you're 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 doing you're hitting web pages faster than a normal user could have been automated so therefore fill out this kafka or i want you to do multi-factor authentication to verify you are you yeah well if i have things like web proxies single sign-on interfaces or any of these large mainstream usually commercial nice devices then i think zero trust is practical because it's not super hard because they're designed with that in mind okay so in terms of the on the other side at least for the first period does it increase like the false positives or potential things that you have to allocate somebody uh, analyst or somebody to look into it, it absolutely can i mean it, it, the problem is you the with the biggest issue is zero trust is how can you truly log and inspect and put in validation for everything yeah. well one you can't do it for truly everything but the, even the things you can somebody has to come up with the logic put it in the device like you'll notice on the market, there's no zero trust, like buy this box and you'll be zero trust. <laughs> no, you can't do that. You can buy boxes that have the capability for logic to be applied to them, however you see fit. Mm -hmm. And you can implement it with a zero trust concept in your mind. There is no, it, it's a practice. And I always joke now, instead of saying uh, trust nothing, validate everything, I say zero trust to me is more of the principle of least privilege practically applied because you should not just have access, you know, are you in this group? Yes, you're good to go. Now it should be validation that even though you're in that group, based on what you're doing, does it look like you still should have access? Okay. So you can- And then you're dynamically changing it based on behavior. So it's basically anomaly detection. Uh -huh. with rules applied to trigger actions based on what the anomaly was. Okay. So can there be false positives? Yes. How bad will those affect you? Depends on what you did. Did you say, I saw you uploading a whole bunch of data, so I just killed your connection? Because I wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Some organizations might, but it, it, uh -huh. that's the problem. There, there can be and there will be false positives. When this occurs, what action did you take? If you just slice the connection, uh -huh. uh, your organization is going to hate you. Okay. From a SIM perspective, are there specific from a data source or from an operations or flow, flow perspective? Do you have to do any changes for a zero trust? What can be? Yeah. So to me, the, a SIM, you know, the central logging mechanism, to me, it's the central brain. You have the data sources over what device is doing what, what user is doing what, you have network connection information, you have user activity monitoring. So what you'll do is you'll say, the behaviors that I want to monitor, and when I see this, I want to change something, the SIM is the brain behind that logic. Mm -hmm. It's where you, all the data is in, and then once you come up with that logic, you react based on it. So where do you think the industry is in terms of looking at patterns and looking at machine learning in SIM? Where do you think it is? How effective it is? What, what is going on in the market right now based on the tools that are out there? Yeah, so, yeah I think we've got two things going on for us that's better than it's ever been. <laughs> One, we know attacker behaviors much better than we ever have because we're sharing that with different organizations. MITRE, attack <laughs> framework, and then there's projects like Sigma, which if you think about it is a way of writing rules against things like MITRE that mm -hmm. work across every single SIM. I don't care if you're using Splunk, ArcSight, QRadar, I wrote this rule in Sigma format so you can apply it to your SIM. So we're sharing rules, we have better knowledge of the attacker methodologies so we can identify those. But then over here we have things like 
data science, uh, even statistical analysis that's way better than we've ever done before, yeah. uh, machine learning, supervised or unsupervised. And we're starting to see where the teams that do the data science aspects mm -hmm. are starting to talk to the security specialists. And yes, data science is a specialty of security, but the problem is these are more, uh, consider them PhD, master degree, uh -huh. very smart individuals, but they're not used to talking in the terms of firewalls or Windows security, Linux security, and how we apply it. Yep. And these two teams are starting to come together. And now what's happening is the tools on the left still generate a lot of false positives, uh -huh. and they can find things we cannot and we're applying our knowledge over here to these data sets and they're becoming really great uh, an example would be if an organization had a powershell based logon script mm -hmm. so every user thousands of users are logging in it triggers a logon script that's powershell but that's the only time anybody outside of it or development is using powershell right so I would like to, on this side, side say, well, if anybody uses PowerShell that's not IT or developers, alert. <gasps> but I can't because of that logon script. Well, but they... now on the machine learning side, it can say, well, if I see PowerShell within three minutes of a logon, that's normal. But I saw it six hours after a logon, I just thought you'd want to know about it. Yeah. So these two coming together is starting to make a very positive impact. And is it more of a organizational thing, like you know, more rather than building building it into the software, kind of like uh, out of the box tools, but more of how you deploy the teams to do bring them? Yeah, I think I think it's the training around how the teams do their jobs. That's what's been changing the most, because now what's happening is they're knowing how to find data in this using knowledge over here from that training. Mm -hmm. And they're now going to the vendors with higher expectations, which is causing commercial tools to be better or allow us to do the tuning because we're demanding it because we know to write the, we know to ask the right questions. Okay, well, that's great. I mean, so any other kind of closing thoughts on how we can improve security operations, what kind of things that they- yep. Yep. Number one thing to me for a successful SOC is your team not the tool mm -hmm. it's you know commercial open source i really don't care right. if you give me a team of people who are passionate are willing to be trained and adapt they'll make it work regardless of the tool like hammer screwdriver i don't care we just we need some tools <laughs> but we'll get this done so make sure your staff has the right training find online training not just vendor training vendors how to use the tool right. I, I, you need that but I also need to know why the why did we choose that tool in the first place? What are we doing? So train your staff, find things online like the MITRE attack framework, Sigma, mm -hmm. there's NSA spotting the adversary, which is a guide by the NSA for what Windows logs to check. Right. Microsoft has their own, like you don't have to reinvent the wheel because the security community is a living, breathing thing. And we actually like each other. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's share more like this podcast, webcast, like there's tons of free information out there. Find it and just keep that passion going. Keep that fire going. That's great. That's well said, uh, Justin. So appreciate it. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on this, you know, and thanks for taking the time to join us for this show. Appreciate yep. it. I appreciate it as well. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. It was great talking to you. You can find more information about Justin's SANS courses at www.sans.org slash instructors slash Justin dash Henderson. And you can also find more information about his company at www.hasecuritysolutions.com. Please go check it out. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for joining. Please don't forget to review and subscribe to us. We would like to help other users like you improve their security, IT, and business operations. If you want to learn more about Scheduler, please visit www.scheduler.com, where you can find tons of information about Elastic Stack reporting and alerting and Grafana reporting. 
You can also download a 21 day free trial with us and see how you can simplify your elastic stack reporting and Grafana reporting and alerting. So thanks again for joining. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.